So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala Rasulil Kareem. I'm very happy, mashallah, we have uh, our brother, um, brother Muhammad back. And today we're going to discuss a rather, I guess, a tricky topic, right? It's, it's, it's a trippy, tricky topic, but it's very important at the same time. And, uh, uh, and so, inshallah, let's see where this goes. We want to talk about tradition and the role of tradition in Islam. Right and the importance of tradition and why it is, you can say, an integral part of Islam. Okay, so uh, I had my points here that I was going over with uh, Brother Muhammad, so we can just kind of like, so traditions practiced on communal. So let me start by the two great cities, maybe right. But before we do that, let's talk about the meaning of the word tradition, right? Uh, tradition, the way that uh, I'm going to take it, is transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation. Now, please underline this idea of generation to generation or the fact of being passed on in this way. Okay, so keep this in mind. What is tradition? Something that's passed on generation to generation. And so let's look at uh, Islam from that perspective, that if this was a possibility if this was something that happened or didn't happen and if it happened then how did it happen and what were the foundations of it happening in terms of tradition being passed on uh, in the beginning you may not realize uh, how important this topic is but as we get into it inshallah i hope inshallah allah clarifies for all of us how important this and how central this topic is um so uh, Brother Muhammad, do you want to say anything to start off with before we talk? Alaykum, as yeah. alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallahu hassan al jazaya, Sheikh. Uh, exactly, I wanted to make a point on the definition of tradition because we are not interested in the second definition of tradition as taken in a theological sense, a doctrine that has been uh, believed to have divine authority. We're not interested in, in uh, the definition number two. What we are taking as tradition today and what we are discussing today is the transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation. This second thing is a man-made thing and, and uh, a later concoction and interpolation uh, sort of thing. And we're not going to go into that. The true meaning of tradition is the trans transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation, as the Sheikh said. Yes. So uh, the way I want to start off this discussion is maybe talking about the importance of Mecca and uh, uh, Medina and Kufa, and then we can go on to Basra and uh, in Mecca. So um, the Prophet established Islam in Medina, right? Everything was being practiced, whatever that Islam was, right? Whatever that Islam was, was being practiced from day one. Meaning, whatever it was, they were praying there. They were burying the dead there. We still have the graveyard Jannat al-Baqi there, right? Uh, they were uh, doing their buying and selling. Everything that requires a city to run was being done in Medina. So now that Islam that was being practiced in Medina was already established and in practice in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. Now as Islam expanded, Islam established other cities. As Islam established other cities, the key city amongst them is Kufa because the Islamic uh, Medina was the Darul Khilafa or the center of the Islamic, you can say the capital state or the capital city was Medina. The city of the Prophet Abu Bakr was there, Umar was there, Uthman was there. But then Ali radiallahu anh, the fourth caliph of Islam, then he moved to Kufa. And then when they moved to Kufa, when Ali moved to Kufa, there were already 2,000 companions of the Prophet already there in Kufa. Okay? Because they had already established these garrison cities. And when Ali moved there, he met with 2,000 companions of the Prophet. So they too had established a city there 
that is fully functional as a city. Okay. And it was based upon the practices of the people of Medina. Because that was Islam at that time. There's no other there's no other city or place or book uh, to go to. You know, it's not like the people of Kufa are reading Quran and coming up with their own interpretation. They're not doing that because they have Medina right there. Right? So they're going, the people of Kufa are going to do everything the people of Medina are doing. Okay? Now that that has these two cities where you can say the, this is where the Darul Khilafah was basically in the beginning. Medina and Kufa. And then with these two, you have both of these, subhanAllah, have twins. So Medina's twin is Mecca, and Kufa's twin is Basra. Basra. So these also became, uh, you know, the main cities other than the Darul Khilafah of Muawiyah radiallahu anh, which was in Syria. Okay. And if you remember, this is the point that you made. Maybe you want to talk about the how this plays into with the Mus'haf also, these specific areas. <clears throat> there is a term actually employed in the empirical study of the data <coughs> surrounding the scriptures that we have of the Quran. And that term is Masahif, <coughs> Masahif al-Amsar. Masahif al-Amsar are the copies of the Imam, the codex which was uh, collected and standardized by the Caliph Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an. These copies were made on a governmental level by the Khalifa, by the order of decree of the Khalifa, by the Lujna that uh, he uh, employed, and were sent out to these regions. Now, in recent times, Haytham Sidqi, um, Dr. Haytham Sidqi, has done an extensive research on this topic and has actually shown uh, through scientific data collection and it is empirically verifiable that all the copies of these regions which were sent to these regions, these emanate, these go back to one exemplar, one exemplar, which is the Imam. And so we have differences at a skeletal level, at a consonantal skeletal level in these uh, copies of the Quran. There are some words which are different, which are called farshul huruf. And each of the copy was accompanied by a qari for that region. So different qira'ats were being taught in these regions. For example, the qira'ah of Hamza Ziyat was in a slightly different dialect than the qira'ah, for example, of Susi or Duri in other regions. So that is the concept of Masahif al-Amsar. And like you said, Sheikh, that this was... On a very practical level, this was something that is a historical established fact. That's why these qira'at are called qira'at al-mashhura al-mutawatira. Because these were mashhur in the awam. It was not like these qira'at were being recited, these different lahjat, these variant readings were recited in a vacuum. <coughs> Like some people had a special gathering and they were reciting one Quran, but the others were praying and they did not know about this Qur'an. It wasn't that way. Everybody knew about these Qur'an. Everybody was reciting in these different Qur'an. Yeah, and some students, they were masters of more than one Qur'an, right? Yes. And they have their um, system of ijazah and all that. Now, coming back to Medina and Kufa, this is very important. Because there's no hadith books. There is uh, not even copies of the Quran the way we... You don't go to a masjid and pick up a copy of Quran in the in the sense that we do today. Right? There, Islam was being practiced in Medina. This is Islam. Islam is Medina. Okay? And everything else is copying Medina. Even Makkah is copying Medina. I, Kufa is the second city. This happened historically in a process of 30 years or so. Okay, So Ku, these two, Medina is the center, is the heart from where everything began. Right? When somebody uh, went to another city like Kufa, they didn't say, oh, who narrated 
that, you know, who said, who said that, who said that the Prophet said that this was not how they established the cities. Absolutely. They simply were living in Medina. They saw how things are done in Medina. They moved out to another city and they tried their best to emulate based upon their circumstances what was already in Medina. So these were living people practicing a living tradition that was there in Medina. People who had seen the Prophet, right? And they're, as they're spreading out specifically to these two cities that I mentioned, Medina and Kufa, and they're trying to emulate the Medina model. Okay? So much so that later on this becomes very important because the great scholar that establishes the Hanafi school is in Kufa. And he gets his ideas of what Islam is in practice from the city of Kufa, from the scholars of Kufa, who were in touch with the companions of the Prophet. The same thing of Imam Malik in Medina. He knew the seven great jurists. This is where Aisha was. This is where the whole uh, many great companions of the Prophet were. This is where Islam started. So Imam Malik is, is codifying Islam, the city of Medina, in his works. That's what he's trying to do. I'll give you an example. This is a mud. It's a, a measurement of liquids in Islam from the time of Medina. This is the same amount that Muslims in Bosnia will be using and Muslims in Tashkent or Bukhara or in Uzbekistan or in Damascus or in Pakistan or Hindustan. Before the colonial takeover, this was the measurement. This was the measurement used by the Ottomans. Now, how did this happen? Well, they were copying Medina. And in Kufa, the companions of the Prophet had a certain amount that they understood in the city of Kufa. This is a mud. But when the Hanafi scholars learned that they have a different mud, a different, uh, they actually had the bowl of the Prophet. And they showed the, the scholars of Kufa that this is the bowl. This is the actual amount. We have the bowl of the Prophet. So then they changed their measurement in accordance to Medina. Okay. The point being here is there's no hadith literature right now. Okay. There's no tafsir books. There's no, there's no even codification of Islam at this point. And, it, and it's meaning this is just the embryonic stage where they're like beginning to understand, okay, how are we going to codify this? Right. What we see in Medina and what we see in Kufa. Do you want to add anything to this? Yes, Sheikh, like we were discussing, uh, this concept of Qala Fulan, Ibn Fulan, and An Fulan, and Qala Samiatu Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Yakul Kadha O Kadha, that so and so narrated that he heard from so and so that the Prophet said so and so, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This concept is a purely academic one. This is a concept that really necessitates from uh, the intellectual struggle that our ulama made against the fitna. Because like you said, when they sensed danger, they built the walls. They, they uh, made the academic, they, they strived to intellectually indulge into these things and create these academic fields of study. If we don't, let's, let's for, a, for a second imagine that we don't have al-Bukhari we don't have Muslim, we don't have Jamia Tirmadhi, for example, for example, would that affect in any way, shape, or form the traditional Islam that we have today? The answer is probably not, mm -hmm. because we have the prayer from the times of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught generations two generations, from generations, two generations. Nobody is going to say, oh, because I don't have Bukhari, I can't go to the mosque and, and pray, right? Or nobody is going to say, because I don't have Muslim, I, I can't 
you know, uh, do fasting in the month of Ramadan. So at least the way I have understood it with my discussion with you is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's existence, his, his, his personality is what we get the culture from, the practical side of affairs. The Quran, first of all, is from Fabin, Famin Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. We believe that the Quran is the word of Allah because the Prophet Sallallahu <coughs> Alaihi Wasallam has, has said so. He told us that these are words of Allah and these are pronounced in these ways. It is from his mouth. And then we have the practical side of affairs. We have the 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 deen this whole ideology, this whole theory put into practice by the Prophet himself. Mm. No book has ever been sent down without a practical example following it. Mm. So the, these things, the, the, the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is what creates the culture. And this is the culture that has been followed from generation to generation. And this is the culture that these two cities were following. And this is the tradition that they were following. And like you mentioned, uh, Imam Abi Hanifa in Naaman, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he wasn't really uh, creating a madhab in his time, thinking that, oh, people would do a taqlid of this or that this is something essential for their deen, that they become muqallids or whatnot. He was simply, like you said, he and Imam Malik, radiallahu anhuma, they were simply taking from the tradition and uh, establishing academic rules and regulations for a jurisprudence. So it was very clear for them. There was no need for that kind of a, let's say, uh, deliberation, that kind of a, uh, intellectual inquisition that we find rampant in today's world into the Hadith literature and whatnot. And they were simply copying and taking from whatever was mutadawil, whatever was in, in, uh, in communal practice. And that is the Islam that has reached to us today uh, as, the, uh, as a community thing, as a tradition. Yeah, they weren't recreating the wheel, right? They weren't like exactly. they were they were just organizing it in a scientific way. Right? Exactly. They were giving it the proper this is sunnah, this is far, this is wajib. They were trying to organize everything in a certain way. Uh, one interesting point you brought up, for example, the month of Ramadan. Okay. How do we know how do we know that uh, that when is the month of Ramadan? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, the Quran doesn't mention yeah. 12 it months. Just mentions, it, it mentions it mentions 12, 12 months. months. It mentions yes, and, uh, 12 months. And it four mentions months. and four are haram, exactly. It give you the haram. name of the other months. No, no. no. So if you don't Absolutely. know the names of the other months, how will you know when is Ramadan? Absolutely. Absolutely. Without tradition, you'll never know when is Ramadan. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? That 100%. There's no way, there's absolutely no way without going back to tradition to know when the month of Ramadan. First of all, the Quran gives you the number of months. It doesn't give you the name of the months. No. So now, where how will you find out when is the month of Ramadan? A person who rejects tradition and a person who rejects hadith will, have no, will be forced to give some weird interpretation, I guess. Right? Some, something that is outside the... <laughs> Again, but this is exactly why tradition is so important. Uh, so I wanted to mention that, but now let me go back to my points I have over here so that I can stay on focus. Just one, one uh, fun yeah, fact here as well, in, in the same uh, vein of uh, thought. Uh, the sa'i between uh, uh, Marwa, uh, what's this other? The... Safa and Marwa? Yes, Safa and Marwa. How would you get that from uh, Islamic uh, literature without tradition? I yeah. don't believe it's mentioned in the Quran at all. Yeah, I mean, it gets deeper than that, as you'll see, inshallah, when we get to the Quran. Oh, itself. much more deeper. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So we have, how does Islam intend to preserve itself? This is the question that I'm posing, right, to you and to myself. and we're... So the first thing that Islam had was a city. From that, we got 
copies of other cities. There was no Bukhari, there was no Muslim, there was none of that. They were simply copying. And then they began to organize different aspects of this in different ways. Over here, I just want to, as a side note, have a discussion with Brother Muhammad on Quran being the worldview and the philosophy of Islam. And the Sunnah being the culture of Islam and that without one or the other, we have an incomplete system. You can say my point number four that I wrote down, theory versus practice. Also, if you have a theory, a philosophy, an idea, but if you don't see it in practice, it's something is incomplete, right? That's why we have the applied sciences, right? So there's mathematics and applied mathematics, or then there's science and then applied science. I want you to say something about this, and then I'll chime in, inshallah. Yes, Sheikh, uh, like we discussed, and um, it was very interesting the way we approached uh, this um, whole thing, the way especially you approached it, is that even if we take away the books of the Hadith, would Islam's foundations fall down? No, because it is built upon the Sunnah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is in the very fabric of the tradition of Islam. So even if you're not studying, for example, Al-Bukhari on your app or Al -Mus or Muslim on your app or Jami al tirmidhi or, or so on and so forth, the tradition that you're following is all based upon that. It's all based upon those ahadith. Doesn't matter if you read it as qala fulanun an fulanin qala sami'tu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam yaqul even if you don't study it that way, still what you are doing is based upon that very thing. So, like uh, I said before, the way I have understood it, that this is, let's say, the academic side of affairs. We have the practical side of affairs, which is, uh, see, Sheikh, this, is, this actually ties into a very important point that I think we made in the last podcast as well, that Allah is Hayyul Qayyum. And so, it logically it cannot be that if the giver of the book is alive that his tradition would be dead or that his tradition would be maqtu would be uh, i don't know what you call that in english what would you say cut yeah cut off cut so the exactly so the tradition is alive as well because allah is the one who says inna alayna jam'ahu wa quran <coughs> The Quran is istimrari. It's fal istimrari. It it recurs, recurs. It's it's going on all the time. Jamahu wa Qurana. So without a an alive tradition, it's unfathomable how the book, the Quran, would be you know implemented in our life. So the city and its growing is one dimension. The second dimension which is extremely important because you could say that the city is like almost like vertical. But the, the horizontal aspect of this is how then as they're bringing the teachings of Medina into their cities, then they're passing this on to the next generation at the communal level, at an institutionalized level. Let me give you an example. Every single child in the entire Muslim Ummah, right? Especially before the pre-industrial age, especially at that time. What's the first thing a child has to do? Learn how to pray? What's the first thing a child has to do? Learn how to eat Islamically? Okay, eat with your right hand. This is not, it's not like, you know, because one of the big tests of Islam is, okay, as Islam was spreading, was it the same Islam? Right, That's the end result to be able to see. So were people in Bukhara, for example, way out in Russia, were they eating with their right hand just like the people in Medina and just like now go all the way down to Morocco, for example? Were they also eating in the same tradition? Because tradition is what's handed down from generation to generation. generation yes. And that is where the sunnah comes in because that practical tradition is the sunnah. Most of it. Most of it's sunnah. 
What are the, the prayers you say before you sleep? What are the prayers after you wake up? What are the prayers you say before you get on your horse or in your car? What are the prayers before you go into the masjid? And I, like, okay, even break it down even more basic. Is there a tradition of building masjids around the Muslim world? A right? very practical tradition. If there was no Bukhari and Muslim and Abu Daud, would we not have had masjids? You would still have masajid. You would, you would still, still have, have masajid. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. You know, if there was no Bukhari and Muslim, would we still have Ramadan? Absolutely. Yeah. Would we still have Hajj? Absolutely. Yeah, the month of Hajj. You also don't know the 12 months for which will be the Hajj of Dhul Hijjah, only using the Quran. Right? Which is why I think uh, some Qur'ani yun say you can go at any time now. Of course, I've heard something like this. But anyway, that that's a separate issue. But I'm what is undeniable, absolutely undeniable, is that if you look at the Muslim world, there are certain things that were taught from generation to generation that was part of the, the ethos of the Muslim culture. Like children had to learn prayers. They had to learn Fatiha. You cannot, and you cannot, you cannot learn to read Quran without somebody teaching you. It's just that that type of book, right? It's a type of book that you have to spend some time learning properly how to read and learning to memorize it. It's, and then you know what I I would I would even go further, but uh, let me see what I have here. And so I made two points that I wanted to. One was the copying of the cities. And the other is generation to generation, how month of Ramadan or Hajj or building a masjid or how to how to eat, how to sleep. These were all imbued within that tradition. That was tra That's what tradition is, what goes from generation to generation. For someone to say, now this is a, an important punch point, that, if you don't mind me, and I'll have you respond to this, is that for someone to say there's no tradition, has to prove that there has been a cutoff from generation to generation in which one generation was not able to pass down the ideas of building a masjid, the ideas of how to pray, uh, pray, the ideas of eating with your right hand, the idea of Ramadan, the idea of Hajj. And these are just examples that I'm using. But these, all these, that one generation was somehow at a mass level after, let's say, Friday khutbahs, right? Is there any difference of opinion in the fact that Friday Jumas have been a, our tradition at an empirical yeah. level, right? Is there is there is there Friday khutbas in Bukhara? Is there Friday khutbas in Damascus, in Mecca, in Lahore, Islamabad, in Delhi, right? So it's 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 not like oh, there's a part of the Muslim world that's not doing Juma khutbas because they just were never taught it, right? I mean, the idea of denying tradition is just. It's like, it's just silly. It's absurd. And this is why, this is why even non-Muslims don't do this. This is what, this is the reason you can't. Because anyone looking at the global ummah knows that there are too many traditionally true things that have been handed down generation to generation that doesn't allow that cutoff to happen for anything to change. Right? And and then I will add that it was not just that they taught generation to generation, but it was the ethos to teach generation to generation. Meaning it was it was known, okay, as soon as my child is born, it was, it was part of the culture itself too. The educational aspect of Islam, everyone's aware of emphasis of education in Islam. And even at even if you take women specifically, right? What's the first subject that has to be taught to women? from a very young age, Tahara, because she has her cycles. She has to learn the rules of the cycles. When she can pray, when she can't pray, how she, what she can do. You have to learn that from, meaning Islam almost created an ethos. You have to pass this on from generation to generation. And this is not even at the, you can say, at a very strong institutional. This is just, this is just at a formal parent to child level. It's not even very institutionalized. It's institutionalized in the sense that the parents would send the child to a school or to a teacher in that sense. But the idea of doing it was so much in tradition, so much in, because that's what everyone was doing.
It was happening from generation to generation. And so there, and it was without any break, except, you know, like I was mentioning, in some parts of the Muslim world, like Spain, where the Spanish Inquisition happened. Now, because it was forced, you know, a complete stop was made of that transferring of that knowledge from generation to the generation. But you can't deny that people in Bukhara or Moscow are doing the same prayers the people in Bosnia are doing, is the, the same prayers, the same Ramadan, the same Hajj, the same building of the masjid in the same direction between all of these, this whole ummah, right? It, it becomes nonsensical. To, but that it is only if once you are clear about, okay, Medina is where it started, the city spread. There was a generational generation teaching of this. Now, when you go back and look at Hadith literature, now you'll actually understand its real place, which is that the Hadith literature is like the tradition looking at itself in a mirror. Meaning the tradition already existed. But the, looking in the mirror was after some time, like Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Daud, is they're, they're, it's almost they're using their academics to, to catch a, uh, you can say, a snapshot, a picture of that tradition in their books. But it was already a living tradition. It would always have been a living tradition. So that's what I want to start off with. And then do you want to say anything to that? I just want to make a quick point uh, about what you were saying, Sheikh, about uh, the Quran and how you have to learn it from someone is that the orality of the Quran is what authenticates the Quran. It w is what makes it the Quran, not the written consonantal skeletal text, because that is almost like a non-word, a non-lexeme. You can't <laughs> pronounce it. You can't really pronounce it unless you know how to pronounce it authentically. So one of the points of confusions that we discussed in today's world was that we have today a printed Quran, which is on a fixed rivaya of Hafs and Asim. And so we think to ourselves, oh, we can read this, we can read this Quran because it is pr pr uh, printed with Fataha, Dhamma, Kasra, the, what we call the Ajam and Tashkil. It has Arab over it. That is why I can read it. But the point here is that you are reading it according to a rivaya because it has been fixed according to the rules of orality, the way they have orally pronounced it, that is the way it has been represented through the tashkil and ijam. So I just wanted to chip in there. Yeah, uh, no, you're you absolutely right. And in fact, uh, let's go ahead and let's see if I can get this. Um, this, okay? This is what Medina had and Kufa had and the Islamic cities had in the beginning. Yes. Okay. Now you cannot read this properly without a teacher. Even Dr. Hani cannot make words out of this on his own <laughs> without tradition. Sure. Okay. So now, uh, for example, over here you can see see it says in Nani and Allah la ilaha illa and you can see that part right right mm -hmm. there's very cl clear. In Nani, indeed I am, and Allah, la ilaha illa, and right? How do I know how to read this? I know it because somebody taught it to me. And somebody taught somebody who taught it to me. The printed Quran, some Hafiz, some person who memorized Quran from his teacher and his teacher, said to the printed version, yes, this is correct. Okay. No it's, printed version today exists, Sheikh, in the world today, which does not have a shahada of a hafiz, that I have right. read it word for word, and I hereby consent to its correctness. That's right. So, yeah. so any printed version has one or more hafiz going over it and consenting that this is that there's no mistakes in this. Yes. And you can't believe the amount of times they print a Quran, find a mistake, and they have to reprint it. Because the half is said there's a mistake here. Yes. Because printing Absolutely. errors happen all the time. You know, uh, the, the this page goes onto that page or that page goes onto this page. This happens all the time. Anyway, 
this this Quran that you're looking at here for people that don't know Arabic, it doesn't have, okay? This does not have the letters as we have them today. This is just a skeletal text from which there are many, many possibilities of many, many different words, okay? There's no dots. There's no ba, ta, fa, right? Ta. Even like, uh, you know, uh, over here, there's, uh, I don't know if they have that here, but you would not know how to read this without tradition. You would not know how to read this in, in the early years of Islam before things were formalized to protect the Quran. Before that, you the only way that they could have known how to read it, and again, this is a very important point, that if this was the Quran, without the tashkil, without the dialectical marks, without the dots that were spread out the Muslim world. How come we then have only one Quran in the sense that within the riwayats, right? Within the riwayat, how do we have a Quran that's still within the riwayats? And that is only possible if there was a tradition of where people had memorized the whole Quran, right? One of the problems with people who deny hadith is that they're, they, they may have read the Qur'an in its meaning, in its translation, but they have spent very little time memorizing Qur'an. because And they have spent very little time with teachers who would correct their Qur'an. Okay, This is because they don't have that appreciation of teacher to student. They don't have that appreciation of uh, the dynamics of, of how knowledge when it comes to Quran, it just simply has to be kind of like passed on. Even if somebody's hearing it on YouTube over and over again, right? They hear it 50 times, 60 times, they learn Fatiha. But ultimately, there's some process of transforming that. And even that Qira that somebody learned on YouTube, if they go to a real Hafiz and start reading, what's going to happen? <laughs> the Hafiz is going to correct them every now and then. <laughs> It'll be... Uh, like you know a lot of people who learn Quran on YouTube and stuff they may think that their tajweed is good but I guarantee you if you sit in front of a hafiz he's going to tell you uh, not yet you know one of the most uh, difficult parts at least I felt for me was sitting with the tajweed teachers and the way that they would you know because just getting from A'udh Billah to Bismillah to the end of Fatiha that's like that takes a long time sometimes. A know? long time, absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And just on the same point, uh, Sheikh, uh, not that just th that this is something that we simply get from the tradition. I mean, really, if you think about it, Sheikh, the, the fact that we today even have to talk about this tells you something about the decline in intellect. I mean, you and me, uh, we are both from the field of academia. I mean, uh, of course, uh, you are uh, much more learned than I am and a, and a true academic, mashallah. Mm -hmm. I'm just a student, but we are both academics. And so <laughs> at some level, I mean, this, for me, this is really stupid that we even have to talk about this, Sheikh. Yeah, unfortunately, it's come to that now. It's come yeah. to that. I mean, it's so right in there, your in your face. I mean, it's at the very basic level of cognition that if you even have the basic cognitive functionality, you would be able to understand that a skeletal, consonantal skeletal text of a language which, which does not have fixed vowels, you will need somebody to tell you how to pronounce it. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, really, it's it's it it becomes very laughable, you know, sometimes for me to even talk about these things. Now, I I will add, if it had, if generation to generation teaching had not been institutionalized and formalized, then we then we would have had like totally different Qurans in the world. Absolutely. But because there was a tradition, and that tradition had a certain level of uniformity with mul multiplicity and pluralism within it, but there was an overall arching, powerful tradition that had a uniformity to it, 
right? The Quran was being recited every day by thousands, Sheikh. Yes. The numbers only increased, not decreased. The yes. numbers increased. I mean, it's unfathomable to even think that, oh, my God. So only 10 people were sitting in seclusion and they were coming up with how to pronounce this word. Okay, let's pronounce it this way. Okay, let's... I mean, thousands upon thousands and then, you know, millions upon millions, they were reciting this very Quran in various uh, dialects, in variant readings, in the Masajid, in Fajr, Dhuhr, Maghrib, uh, Asr, Maghrib, Aisha, Tahajjud, in Qiyamul Layl, at homes, with teachers. I mean, really, Sheikh, this is, <laughs> I mean, like I say, I'm, I'm at Unfortunately, what the modern world do has done, it has removed uh, the experience of generation to generation learning. See, what happens in the in the modern times is parents are no longer teaching their children. So that's their experience. So parents grow, parents have children and they say, okay, you're going to learn Quran, go over here. You're going to go to school, go over here, right? And there is no one-on-one. -on -one. There was always a teacher, but the father was always, and the mother was making sure, are you actually learning? Like, <laughs> you know, the parents were much more involved generational to generation grandfathers would meet their grandchildren. And one of the main things would be like, huh, how much Quran did you learn? You know, Absolutely. you know, and, and how much did you, oh, you're not doing this according to the Sunnah of the Prophet. Oh, so you don't have, your clothes are not uh, proper. Oh, your, your clothes, you know, uh, oh, you can't go there in front of men or you can't just travel without mahram. Uh, like whatever the issues were, they were, Issues that were on their mind and they were teaching to the next generation, every generation, every generation, every generation, every generation, right? This is a fact, meaning you can see the uniformity of this in the Muslim Allah. And, and now, uh, let us now continue to, oh, yeah, so I'll, I'll bring up this issue. How, how much so? So let's just uh, take one example. I have written here Mahadaj, for example. Maybe you should talk about the Mahadaj. <laughs> Sheikh, uh, really, uh, you are too kind. Allah um, uh, Makharij al Huruf. Now, I was born and raised in, in Saudi Arabia, right? And I can tell you this as first hand experience. I mean, Arabic really is almost like my mother tongue because my father was already in Saudi Arabia for 16 or 17 years before he got married. So, uh, you know, I learned it from him, first of all, at home. And I can tell you this for surety, that the way you pronounce the Quran, Arabic is normally not spoken like that. Mm. The, the Quran is pronounced in an entirely different way. You would never hear this kind of Arabic spoken in this way in the streets of Makkah, for example, or in streets of Medina, for example, or in streets of Jeddah, for example. Yeah. And by the way, Sheikh, I don't know about Masr because you've been to Azhar. I don't know if dialects even vary a little between the cities. In Saudi, Jeddahween, Jeddahween, they speak differently from Makkahween. Well, the Flahin, uh, the, the farmers, they speak differently than the city differently. people. Differently. The Badawi, the, the Badawi, yeah. they speak differently from the ones who are living in, in Jeddah, for example, or in the city, in, in the <laughs> metropolitan city of Makkah, for example. It is a ve very different dialect. A normal person living in Jeddah would hardly understand the Amiya, the slang of Makkawi. And so even they have to learn the Makharaj of Huruf. Like there are certain uh, rules that are employed through which you pronounce the words of the Quran in a specialized way. For example, qalqala, for example, the miqzar of the mad, for example, the tanween, when noon becomes a meme, when it doesn't become a meme, the idgham, idghamul harf, bil harf, idghamul kabir, and idghamul sagir. And so all of these are specialized rules of enunciation. Yeah, and without. And Sorry, no, go ahead. 
No, no, not at all, sir. I'm trying to share. practice not interrupting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, that's all right. I was going to say that, Allahumma Sunya Muhammad. So, um, the first of all, the letters come from a specific. So, for example, Haruf Shafawain, right? So, you have Mim, Ba, Fa, they come from the lips, right? Everything is, everything within the tradition is very, very, uh, Specific, clear, specific, specific, and whether if you were again, if you were in Basra or whether you were in Bukhara or whether you were in Tashkent or whether you were in Turkey or whether you were in Iraq, you pronounced ba exactly the same way, right? Yes. It's this not was like the point. Yes, this it, was the point, Sheikh, I was about to make that even though the army are differ even amongst the cities, when you read the Quran, you recite the Quran. A Makkavi reading a Quran would be exactly ditto the same as a Madani or a Jaddawi. Hmm. So they will all recite the Quran the same way. You go to um, uh, Haram al Madani, you will hear if, if the Ribaya is the same, of course, if it is in Hafs and Asim, you would hear the Qari pronouncing the huruf, huruf the same way from the same makharij that the Makkawi uh, imam would be pronouncing them from. This is the tradition that we are talking about because it has come down from generation to generation. There is not even a single, even a difference of, a, of an iota between yeah. these pronunciations. Like, like one example, you mentioned Qalqala, right? Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Now this... Ahad, right? Or Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. So this echoing at the end or the clicking at the end of the letter. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Or Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. Right? This clicking is not on the text. The text is not telling you to read this this way. The text is not even telling you that it's a qaf. Like in, in, in the sense of looking at it from today. Oh, very interesting, Sheikh. Even in the fixed rivaya of Hafs and Asim, the printed version, the Kalkala cannot be represented on the written page. Yeah. You can represent the Ajam and Tashkil, but how can you make a sign of Kalkala on the Kaf? Yeah. So, so no curious. one comes to Mecca from anywhere in the Muslim world and says, oh, this person's not reading Fatiha the way I was taught and my parents were taught generation to generation. It doesn't happen. So to deny that there's tradition is completely absurd. And and inshallah, let's just go ahead, please. Yes, uh, uh, one very quick point, a fun fact again, Sheikh. I was talking to uh, this kid who uh, held uh, Mr. Still holds Mr. Ramadi in high regard, and we were uh, hashing it out, some ideas back and forth. And one of the points that I made to him was that Ramadi Sahab was not probably exposed to uh, the Qira'at early on in his life. Mm. For example, somebody like me, I feel very fortunate to have been born and raised in Saudi Arabia, to have played in the streets of Makkah in my early childhood. This is a normal thing there. I mean, yeah. you would go to Haram and Makki, you will enter into the Haram through Mashru or Makkah, and you will find people sitting right in front of Bab al-Multazam, and having a Barsh version of Quran in the Rahal and reading it, yeah. reading Maliki Yawmiddin. There are halaqat, Sheikh, and you know this better than me. Uh, I'm sure when you've been to Mecca, you've seen those halaqat. You know, there is halaqa al-hadith, there is a halaqa of fiqh, there is a halaqa of qiraat right in front of uh, the uh, Kaaba. There are people who are sitting there. There is a sheikh who's sitting there. He's reciting the Quran in all 10 qiraat. So when you are exposed to this at a very early stage in life, this is really not a cultural shock. I think some of the people who go towards denying this reality, maybe psychologically speaking, is because they have some sort of a trauma resulting from a cultural shock when they were uh, exposed to it. You can better, you know, elaborate on that if you like. But I felt it that way. I just wanted to, you know, make a quick point about it. Yeah. So uh, one thing that uh, I want to uh, mention here is um, 
<clears throat> just some points that I have written here. Um, for example, Zamzam water. People go to Mecca, drink Zamzam water, facing the Kaaba, standing up from out the Muslim world, right? Every every person that it's not like people go to Mecca and and there's no one to tell them what to do and how to do. Now the teachers that are in, let's say, in India, or the teachers that are in Pakistan, or the teachers that are in Iraq, when they go with their people to the Haram, to Mecca, or to Medina, they're doing. Everyone's doing everything the same way. We're doing Tawaf the mm -hmm. same way. We're doing the Sa'i uh, to Safa and Marwa the same way, right? Yes. Okay. It's it's not like there's a group of people petitioning. Oh, well, we prayed behind the Imam and we prayed. Uh, we uh, he he did. Uh, you know, th they prayed four cycles. Let's say for Dhuhr, for example, and we we want to pray five. You know that. <laughs> It, exactly. The, 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 when you understand, once you understand there is a living tradition that has been taught generation to generation, and that is in at both formal, informal, institutionalized, non institutionalized levels. Once you realize that, once you understand that, then the hadith literature will make much more sense because there comes a well, we'll talk about how it's all meshed in with language and, and culture. But another very good example, for example, you know, if, if there was one thing in which there would have been easily a difference of opinion, if there was no tradition, easily, is to say Amin after Fatiha. Because there's no Amin in the text of Quran after Fatiha. No one has written Amin after the text of Fatiha, even though we all say it in throughout the Muslim world and the Muslim history. No one has written in the text of Quran. I mean, even though after Fatiha, we say, I mean, we have to say it. Because it's not an ayah of the Quran. So it's not like other it. du'as that, like, there's du'as at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. There's du'as at yeah. the end of Surah Al-Imran. There's du'as throughout Quran. We don't say, I mean, for any of those. Right? We only say, I mean, for Fatiha. Now, it could have happened if the tradition was not strong. But this is the proof that their tradition of Islam was so strong that even something as small in some ways, small and something in some ways significant, something as small as saying Amin was preserved throughout the Muslim world. Everyone knew after Fatiha, you have to say Amin. To the point there was a debate if you should say it loud or not loud. Oh, absolutely. It was such an integral part. It became such an integral part of tradition that then the then the the jurisprudence schools they had to you know hash it out between themselves. And you know, if it was not formalized and institutionalized, it would have been very easy for Amin to become part of Quran. Because yes, to the listener, maybe. to the to the layman listener, he's reading Fatiha and he sees Amin, so he would say, "Okay, this is part of Quran." Absolutely. But because yes. there is a tradition, because there is things are institutionalized through the process of ijaza, right? You can't just stand up and just lead prayer, in, especially in the traditional, meaning anyone can lead prayers. That's not the issue. But I'm saying as an imam in, 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 in an authoritative office of an imam, or you can't just do that without formal training. And so... That formal training comes on the basis of understanding tradition. So it's yes. taught formally in, in an institutionalized way, but it's also taught to the child. Yes. Right? It's also taught to the child how to read the Quran. And so the, the tradition of Islam is very dynamic in that sense. It's very powerful, very dynamic, very, and it, it, it is overwhelmingly uh, powerful. And one of the great things Islam did to create this tradition, right, is that it removed racism, yes. right? It removed yes. racism. So there's no difference between white and black. Okay, black people do Islam this way and white people do Islam this way and the Asians will do Islam this way. No, there's cultural differences in how we'll each dress, how we'll each speak. We'll talk about that in a second. But there was, there, there was the, the black is teaching the, white the black is teaching the asian right the and and vice versa 
right? So the point I'm trying to make is that the there are litmus tests you can see, not the fact that there was a tradition and that was uniform is a fact. The fact that you, you can then verify empirically by this idea I gave of Amin, for example, as a study case of how strong that tradition was, how powerful that tradition was. So, um, yeah. So do you want to say something? <clears throat> yes, Sheikh. Uh, again, this comes back to that idea of practice, things being done over and over and over and over and over and over again. There is no possibility of denying any of this. I mean, it would be really naive etching on stupidity if somebody says, you know, this doesn't matter. And like you made yeah. a point earlier here, yeah, like you made a point earlier, even the Western academics, the mustashriqeen, the orientalists, they can't deny this. Mm. They'll have to, even if some of them deny hadith, they can't deny the tradition. They can't. It's it's about even your personal experience, like we were uh, talking about with your professors, right? They kept... Uh, raising issues with hadith with the canon of hadith but when you talk to them about the tradition they had no good answer to it didn't yeah. they because it is two plus two four i mean it's it's that kind of a reality which does not need you know an argument in the first place it is given it is a given it is something you build upon not something that you start with by questioning so it is a reality a fact that cannot be negated. It's as simple as that. Yeah, and I want to give just two examples, right? Uh, about how, like, you, you really have to, I guess, send, spend some time thinking about how deep this goes. I'll give you an example. When you have read the Quran, say, A'udhu Billah. Now, the ayah is in the past. Yes. The literal meaning of the ayah is, after you have finished reading Quran, then seek uh, uh, protection from shaitan. Falta qara'ta in yeah. the past, in, in the, the past. Mouth. When yes. you have finished reading Quran, seek protection from Satan. That's yes. the literal meaning of the Quran, even though what's the tradition? You start Thank with you. saying, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan al Yes. The same thing in the ayah. وَإِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ Now, when you have stood up for prayer, then wash your face. What would that mean? That once I have made my niyyah and said my takbir al-tahrima, now wash your face. That's one interpretation. Right? Yeah, literally, it means that. Literally, it means that. Yeah, people don't realize that, uh, that if you want to go literal with what Quran is saying, you're going to be in a lot yeah. of trouble. Yeah, if you want to go the semiotic way, morphologies <laughs> and juzur, then the juzur say that qum tum fil mab in, in the past tense. Wa idha qum tum ila salati fagusilu wujuhakum. So then what their prayer should be for a Qurani yun, prayer should be the wadu. <laughs> yes. If you want to take, True. because wa idha qum tum ila salati, when you stand up for prayers, okay, what's the prayer? Wash your face. That's, that's your prayer. prayer. Absolutely, yes. Right? But that's not the prayer that's been going on for 14... I mean, it, unfortunately, most of these brothers, Qur'ani Yuns and the others, they're not going to know the, the significance of what I'm trying to say here. But if you go absolutely literal, the Qur'an says literally, and when you stand up for prayers, wash your face. Yes. That's what it's saying. That means the interpretation, if you want to take it literal, is the way to pray is to wash your face and then wash the other parts of the body. That is the prayer. Yes. Absolutely, yes. So you have on the one side a certain view of these texts, a certain, uh, a certain level of, yes, Quran allows people to dive into it, but it's also anchored on something real. And that something, re you cannot understand Quran, for example, without its Makki and Madani uh, uh, distinctions. 
Exactly, Sheikh. This was the point that I was making in the last discussion that we had as well. That if this were a book, a, a, a literary text like Hamlet or Romeo and Juliet or like Edward Bond's C, <coughs> for example, or like Fred, Fe, Federico Garcia Lorca's Blood Wedding, for, for that matter, then your interpretation is a kumtum ila salati that when you have stood in the prayer, wash your uh, face and wash your hands would be a valid one. Yeah. Right? Because there is no living tradition attached to it. That's right. Then the author is dead. Then everything else is discarded. Only the text on its own is something that one needs to adhere to. Right? That is the premise. Yeah. So if that is the case, then any and every interpretation can go, can work. And that is the difference between a living tradition and a dead book. A book that can, that only stands in its own structure, in its own textual and linguistic structure. And that is a huge difference. This is actually a point of frustration for me as well, Sheikh, when I am indulging into back and forth with my Qurani brothers and sisters, that they don't understand this very basic and very apparent point. So, uh, you know, an example of that me and you were talking about uh, in regards to this uh, issue was baptism, right? Yes. So Christians, why why is baptism still a living tradition in some cr Christian circles? Because simply they were taught generation to generation. Yes. Right? And it's that simple. Can you show all you have to do to say that there's no tradition in Islam? You have to show that there was a generation that was not able to show teach another generation. And yes. because time is running out, I want to give that uh, uh, example that I, I was talking about the, you know, when, when the African American, when the African Muslim slaves, because the slaves in America were brought from West Africa, when they brought the slaves to America, what's the first thing they did? They separated the parents from the children. Now, that is an example of where tradition would break. But even these little children knew some of their tradition in the beginning, but there was a cut. Right, they were writing Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the Bibles that they had. Right, and 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 some of these slaves that had come, some of them were more literate than their masters. And this is a whole discussion in itself. But the parents were cut off from the children at a mass level, so that knowledge of Islam didn't reach some of these kids. And so then that if which city ever, even during the Crusades or during the Mughal, uh, the, the Tatar ta ta invasion, or um, which city ever broke off teaching its tradition to its children? That process really, if it has ever happened, right, it, like at the global level, it's happening now. Meaning if ever it's happening now, it was never happened before. So, the uh, and and now it's happening because parents are not really teaching their children anything of Islam. They they expect the Molvi Sab to do all the teaching for that. Yeah. Anyway, so that that's a separate issue. But the other thing that I think you know you're really really good at discussing, and I just want to throw it out there is that the Islamization of language within the, so so there one was there's no racism as Islam was spreading, so it allowed this kind of like generation to generation intermarriages and then as muslims and islam became the dominant force within any culture it also changed the language the ethos and the language of that place so if you listen to swahili for example swahili is completely islamized even though it's yes. not arabic farsi is completely islamized urdu and pashto and farsi yes. all these languages are completely islamized Yes. You want to say something about that? Yes, Sheikh. Also, I wanted to quickly make two points here. Uh, since we talked about uh, baptism, and so we also uh, talked about how sometimes there are some concoctions, some interpolations in the tradition, but the majority, and by majority, we mean the Sawadi Adam, the community as a whole. It always stays on the righteous path because it is illogical to fathom that a community would uh, uh, come together on falsehood. So that is the anchorage then 
the scriptural end craze that our tradition has as well. Um, also, this on, on the point of uh, language, yes, I mean, Urdu, like you said, is, is so Islamized that you have certain words forbidden actually by your parents or by your elders. For example, uh, pig in, in, in our region, you can't say the Urdu uh, word for pig in your language. Your, your parents would actually prohibit you from saying that. Why? Because uh, in the Quran, Allah associates uh, the status of haram with with the uh, with mm. pig and so it it is true the 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 at the level that language works uh sheikh since your field is 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 psychology jacques lacan actually has proposed is on the record proposing that our subconscious is structured like a language mm. so language actually is what structures our <coughs> subconscious and so when you have the tradition, overwhelming and overarching tradition in a society, which also shapes and forms your cultural inferences, your norms and morals, and whatnot, the totems and taboos, then definitely the language reflects all of that. So, and, and, and in turn, then your whole makeup, your psychological makeup then follows through. Yeah. And, you know, Alvin Toffer uh, is sociologist. He had uh, an axiom of sociology and culture, which is that culture resists change. As a normative fact, any culture will resist change. Sure. On the one side, we have this, right? So we have the, the Islamic culture, which is the sunnahs of the prophet, the Islamic ethos. And then you have the regional culture intermixed. Yes, right? absolutely. Yes, And you have... One of you have this in Nigeria, Muslims in China, Muslims in Indonesia, Muslims in Malaysia, Muslims in India, Muslims in all over. They all have this common universal ethos, common universal culture. For example, the Imam of the Prophet, right? The the, the turban of the Prophet وسلم, with one or two tails. Now they wear that in Indonesia, they wear that in Malaysia, they wear that in India, they wear that in Afghanistan, they wear that in the Arab world. Everyone that common ethos is there. And then you have the academics of Islam to to fight off the wrong ideas within any culture. Not just any ideas. If it's if it's a good idea or if it's a, just a muba idea, it has yeah. no problem. So that is my point here is that the tradition of Islam. For example, saying inshallah, mashallah. Okay. These, this ethos of saying subhanallah, if something bad happens, alhamdulillah, if something good happens, uh, this ethos, again, pervasive within the whole entire Muslim world. You know, so it's not like uh, somebody in Indonesia is like, every time I start food, I say subhanallah, I don't say bismillah. That, there's no such thing. The person in Indonesia is saying Bismillah and the person in Moscow and Bosnia, and, uh, they're all saying Bismillah. Absolutely. You know, and so, so, yes, yes, yes. And so on that point that even if you have interpolation or concoction on a localized level in some of the subcultures or groups or subgroups, that is not in, an argument against the tradition. Because no matter which culture, subgroup or subculture you belong to, you are going to go to the mosque and pray. It doesn't matter if in my culture, for example, it is taught that if black cat, you know, cuts your way, it's going to be a bad day for you, the superstition. I'm still going to go and pray five times a day in the mosque. Mm. So that is the culture. That is the overarching culture, the, the, the bedrock. And, there are things sometimes added to it, which are concoctions or uh, interpolations um, according to a locale, according to a, a, a milieu, and that are easily distinguishable from what is the righteous path of the majority. And by the way, Sheikh, like we also talked, the Quran, when it says, Sullatun min al awwaleen wa qaleelun min al akhireen, it's talking about Muslims, it's talking about sawad adam not a subgroup in the Muslim ummah that usually is hinted upon by the so-called Quranists or the right, rest. Right, right, yes, absolutely. Um, now, I want to talk about the last point, inshallah, very quickly, 
um, is the Hadith literature and how that ties into tradition. Okay. Um, I'll say a few sentences and then maybe you can uh, end it. Uh, and that is that the as this tradition pervades and as there are formal and informal institutions. So you have the cities, you have generation to generation teachings, and then you have institutionalized and non-institutionalized methods of passing this on, right? If in Mecca, someone says the prophet said A, and the person in Kufa says the pro, and there's a whole chain, different chain of people. Now, this is a few generations when things are becoming formalized. Bukhari is there, Muslim is there, Abu Dawud is there. The Islam has been canonized into different mazahibs. Now, when that's there, now when there is a person in, or in, when when it's in the process of this happening, when somebody in Mecca says the Prophet said A. And a person in a chain, a group of chain of people says in Kufa or Damashq, the Prophet said A. Right? Then we know these two chains haven't met each other. There's no fax machines. There's no internet. There's no telegram. Right? Now, two groups of people who haven't met each other are saying the Prophet said A. And they're from two different cities. And what they're saying fits within our tradition. Fits within the scope of our tradition. This, I'm saying this so that it can help. A per and, and by the way, this is the, there are times where the narration is coming from Damascus and Mecca and uh, Basra and, and a few other places. And there, there may not be 100% the same words, but it'll be A plus one, A plus two, A, you know, similar versions of the, of the, of the narration coming from different parts of the Muslim world. This was only logical because of the uniformity of that culture, of that of that uniformity of the, the culture of the Muslims, right? And so it was logical that every single part of the Muslim world had some common overlapping traditions from the Prophet that could be verified because other, cult, other cities were saying the same thing, right? And this is another... Part, you know, people sometimes, for example, criticize Abu Huraira in Allah Hadith Allah. literature. But everything Abu Huraira said can be verified by other companions. I mean, it's it's a very multi-layer system that Islam developed, whether it was the Quran, whether it was Hadith literature, whether it was our, our tradition as a whole, because the uh, the the there were a lot of competing institutionalized forces. For example, the fuqaha were competing against the muhaddisin, for example. Um, you had uh, had these narrations from person X, but you have similar traditions from person Y that can be then counter-referenced. So it, it, it wasn't just a strong tradition, but then there is a strong scholarship under that tradition, under holding that tradition, that strengthened it so much that it's 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 a it, it's a cross referenced tradition. So yeah. So what are your last words? Absolutely, Sheikh. Um, the Quran and the Hadith, they have both been interwoven into the fabric of our culture and tradition, and they are inseparable. Inseparable, really. Mm. Doesn't matter if you have Ibn Majahid collecting the sab later on, or Ibn al-Jazari, Muhaqqiq Ibn al-Jazari, collecting the tatimma of the three qira'at, the edition, or Dumiyati, Imam Dumiyati, collecting the four qira'at after that in his Ittihaf of Udala al-Bashar, fil qira'at al-Arba al al-Ashar. <coughs> Even if these people have, would have uh, had not canonized the ten qira'at, Still today, we would have had the Quran read in multiple variant readings. Because why? Because it was it is the traditional thing to do since the beginning. It is in the tradition. In the same uh, vein of thought, even if we did not have Bukhari and Muslim and uh, other books of Hadith, Musnad Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, for example, 
we would still have been doing the same things from the tradition. This is something that usually people who are not well read into these things, they don't understand that cementing Yes, Sheikh, you forgot this part. <laughs> so cementing, for example, the canon of Ashara Qira'at in an academic way only adds and supplements the tradition in an intellectual academic way. It, it makes absolutely no dent on the tradition itself. Even if we did not have Kitabu Saba by Ibn Mujahid today, Sheikh, do you think we wouldn't have had these variant readings? Of course we, we would. We would yeah. still have these variant readings. And so that this is the important point to note. This These are academic ventures, and our ulama have ventured into this academically, alhamdulillah. It is one of those intellectual traditions in the world <coughs> today that we can be proud of. When you read these books, when you do a deep dive into these academic fields, you're like, subhanallah, man, what a meticulous uh, struggle and strife of our ulama who have delved into this. So, yeah, Sheikh, I would like to, you know, end on this note, inshallah. I just want to end with this, is that in Medina, in the Masjid of the Prophet, the Masjid of the Prophet, they had a stick on which the Prophet did Juma khutbas. Yes. What was the result? Every tradition, every region of the Muslim world had these staffs in their masjid. Okay, Maybe some of you haven't still seen a khatib with this because it's not that common anymore because the modern times. But before the modern times, before yes. the 1950s, every masjid had this. Starting because it was in Medina. The Prophet had a certain measuring system for liquids, for example, he did his wudu in a mug. They took that exact measurement and created its replica, replica, just like this, just like this. That tradition remains and is intact. Uh, it it doesn't, yeah, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Daud, in a way that strengthens the whole tradition. And if it had not been Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Daud, people Allah chose, it would have been other people, other okay. other methods, other systems. They could have come up with many other systems, but that's the system that they came up with. But the tradition, the what would the, that system be doing? It would still be upholding the same edifice, that same teachings of Medina, the teachings of that city of Medina that left in an active state, generation to generation teaching while the prophet was alive. It was, and, it, and, and since Medina, the blessings has been and this is one of the signs of Islam being the true religion, is that there's been no cutoff point from that tradition, right? Like with other religions, there comes off these cutoff points uh, where, like in Judaism and Christianity, there are many cutoff points. But Islam had no cutoff points in its history. Absolutely. So I will just end with that. Uh, inshallah, do you have any last words? Jazakallah wa ahsan al jazaya shaykh. Allah Allah Shalla Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa rahmatullah wa